from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. We're delighted you're listening to this podcast. If you enjoy it, please be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and elsewhere. Please also be kind enough to leave us a favorable review. Now, at the Journal's editorial page, we believe passionately in free expression, and each week on this podcast, we explore the big issues in candor and depth with leading figures in the fields of politics, business, science, technology, arts, and culture, and other fields. My guest this week is Kellyanne Conway, political consultant, strategist, and pollster. Kellyanne, of course, was senior counselor to Donald Trump throughout most of his presidency after she had been the first woman to manage a successful presidential campaign. She's out with a new book, a memoir, Here's the Deal, which documents her life from a child growing up in a one-parent family in southern New Jersey, where she was raised by actually a mother, a grandmother, and two unmarried aunts, she says, to the very pinnacle of politics in the White House. After graduating college, she went into the polling business, working for corporate clients, as well, of course, as a succession of Republicans, including Newt Gingrich, Mike Pence, and others. In the early stages of the 2016 Republican presidential primary, she worked for Ted Cruz, but then joined the campaign of Donald Trump, a man she'd known for some time in New York, not least because she and her husband had lived in a condo in a Trump residential building. She worked for almost four years in that turbulent times in the Trump administration, finally leaving in August 2020, which, given what was to come in the following few months, looks like very good timing. She's now once again working on various campaigns including advising a number of Republican candidates in the midterms. And she joins me now. Kellyanne, thank you very much for joining me. It's always a pleasure, Jerry. Thank you for having me. So let me start, if I may. You are once again advising the Republican candidates, amongst other things. Donald Trump is out there, it seems, on the brink, probably, of declaring another presidential campaign. This seems like a natural, happy marriage of supply and demand. Kellyanne, are you expecting to be reunited with the man you work for? As goes Trump 2024. I have had those direct conversations with President Trump. And my advice to him privately and publicly is the same. If he wishes to be president of the United States again, he should have a cage match rematch against Joe Biden and offer a binary policy and accomplishments contrast from the Trump White House to the Biden White House. No more of this talking about the past, look toward the future, develop a vision. But look, that has to be weighed against any number of countervailing factors. The biggest one, in my view, is whether the people who want to constantly investigate him and his family and the people around him are ever going to let up on the gas. It looks like they won't. So that's a very personal decision for him. But President Trump is like a majority of Americans, Jerry. He sees that the country is headed way off on the wrong track, veering toward economic decline, if not depression and recession. He's upset that Putin is in Ukraine, that a nuclear-capable Iran is salivating, looking at our greatest friend in the region, if not the world, Israel that there's total lack of border security, an increase in crime and drugs. Joe Biden, with his hand on the tiller, we've got rising prices, inflation is the number one issue to Americans. So everywhere you look, there's chaos and crisis. And frankly, it's not just a matter of Americans being resilient, optimistic, hopeful about the future. It can get better. It's many Americans, Jerry, saying it was so much better not that long ago, and I want that back. So if President Trump can channel that, into a viable campaign for president. And the polls suggest that he would beat Biden or Harris and that he's the front runner in the Republican primary, then he should do that. But he does lose a lot of independent voters when he keeps talking about the 2020 elections. People want to talk about the future. But that's the point, isn't it? He doesn't seem to want to do that. I mean, I'm sure he wants to talk about the future too, but every time he speaks about the election, he talks about the stolen election of 2020. And he seems to regard, if he does run for the presidency, as a kind of righteous restoration to right the wrong that was done to him in 2020. You know him very well, Kellyanne. Is he capable of putting that behind him? He is capable. And I believe that he would have to do what he did in 2016, which is make the election the campaign campaign, the entire movement about the people, not about him. And every good candidate must do that, particularly for president. People have to feel you're not in it for yourself. You're in it for them. And of course, he's capable of doing that. We saw him do that to great success, to historic success in 2016. So I like to say vintage Trump can make a resurgence in 2024, but it's a very important message. The grievances have to be the people's grievances not your own personal grievances. That's not just for Donald Trump. That's for every successful presidential candidate. And the last thing I'll say to you, Jerry, is with very few exceptions, maybe 1972, people go for the presidential candidate that they think is more optimistic, hopeful, forward-looking. That's why you've seen some Republicans and some Democrats win over time. And I think, look, 2020 was a very odd election year. You had more people voting in more ways over a longer period of time than ever before. COVID compelled election. And if you're really concerned about the 2020 election, as we all should be, 
There are plenty of shenanigans, plenty of malfeasance. I don't like the Zuckerbucks, you know, almost a half a billion dollars going into precincts that favor Joe Biden heavily. All of that is legitimate. But if you want that to never happen again, then focus your energies there and say, hey, folks, if that was because of COVID, then we can't just have universal mail and ballots. We can't have election season instead of election day. Those are legitimate points. But right now, the country is suffering and hurting people, particularly Trump voters, Jerry, in 2016 and 2020. They are hurting under this economic depression, if not recession. And I am sick and tired of Joe Biden talking about moving backward. We need somebody to talk about moving forward. And I want people to focus on the here and now also of today. Look, the Democrats wake up every day is January 6th. And you've got a lot of people waking up and saying, and every day is November 3rd, 2020. It's neither. You can't have half the country in curious about what happened in 2020. The other half, inconsolable. You've got to look forward. And if President Trump's willing to do that, he can build on that spark. One of the things you say in your book, which a former president, of course, disputes, is that you told him after the 2020 election that he'd come up short, to quote what you say in your book. Now, he disputes that you said that to him, but is that your view, that actually he did lose the election and he should acknowledge that and move on? My conversation with him that is related in the book was about December 14th. That's the date by which, in 2020, the electors were going to certify the election results for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And I was telling him, as you say, I was long gone from the White House and still talking to the president. I said, Mr. President, you're running out of time. And if you can produce that evidence, are people going to re-vote in a certain county or state? Is there an audit that will be completed? Are there boxes of votes coming through? I mean, all these things that people, I think, supplicant after charlatan after showman who were able to go in front of the Resolute Desk and promise him goods that they could not deliver, Jerry. I said, you're running out of time because you're coming up short before December 14th. Now, other people had an idea of blowing past December 14th and going into January 6th and taking a fifth bite at the apple. But I was talking about December 14th. Of course, it came up short. The electors did certify the election. It broke my heart. I wanted Donald Trump to have a second term. There's no question that Joe Biden is the president. Look around, everybody. If you need proof that Joe Biden and not Donald Trump are the president, look around, go fill up your tank, go fill up your grocery cart. Go try to do almost anything that you were able to do in a freer society. But was his election legitimate, Kellyanne? Well, I think it was an unfair election in many ways. I think we'll never really know all of the ins and outs, the shoots and ladders of the 2020 election. Again, you look at movies like Rigged. I think that was a very important movie just because it gives you the facts and figures that the official filings from the Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife's two nonprofits that said, you know, it sounded like a virtuous idea, Jerry, to have these COVID compelled voting measures that made sure there were safe elections for everybody who wanted to participate. But why in the world did any grant that was over a million dollars go to 92% of the precincts that went for Joe Biden? Don't you want us all to vote safely? So I think there will always be unanswered questions. People are swearing under affidavits about malfeasance, but it was never enough in enough states to change the election results by the time you need to do that. Look, I'm very critical in my book, Here's the Deal, highly critical in a way nobody else has had the guts to do it. Of his 2020 re-election campaign, Jerry, they had $1.4 billion. They had quadrupled the resources we had in 2016, but they lacked the hunger and the swagger and frankly, the strategic insights. They lacked the ability to respond to what America said was vexing and perplexing them. It was no longer the economy, it was COVID. You don't tell Americans what's important to them, they tell you. And you must reflect that back in your messaging and your messenger. Highly critical. I thought his 2020 campaign should have won outright and overwhelmingly in a way that would have put to rest any question about who the victor had been. They lost to Joe Biden. Can you imagine this guy who had buried himself in a basement who popped out like a groundhog on February 2nd once in a while to give a very uneven, head-scratching interview to someone and then disappear again. They should have been able to beat Joe Biden, the guy we see every day, unable to do the job, not demonstrating competence or inspiring confidence as president of the United States. They should have beat that guy. And that's why you don't hear from anybody on the highest echelon of his election. Where's Brad Parscale's campaign manager? Where's Jared Kushner, who liked to tell everybody he was a campaign manager? Where are his pollsters? I want to hear from them. What the heck happened? You say they and you point the finger at various people around the president, but isn't the president himself largely responsible for what happened to his election campaign in 2020? And by the way, in the book, you were there in the early stages of the COVID pandemic. There were extraordinary successes. Everybody can agree. The vaccination, the efforts to compensate Americans who were losing their jobs. These were very successful efforts. A lot of credit goes to the administration. But you also document in the book some of the kind of erratic 
craziness, to be honest with you, that the president demonstrated through those press conferences early on and the sense he gave that to a lot of Americans who were alarmed about COVID, whether or not they were right to be alarmed about it, that he wasn't really on top of it. He wasn't taking it seriously. Wasn't that in the end more important and always going to outweigh whatever great campaign they may have been able to come up with in the fall? The campaign should have understood COVID and the way Americans were regarding COVID, particularly the so-called suburban woman who's very concerned. Her kids were home. Screen time is school time. She's worried about, obviously, the health of her immediate family, but also the elders in her life, Jerry. They were at greater risk, obviously, statistically. So it was a fraught time of uncertainty. And when you have uncertainty, you need to project a lot of calm, compelling data, facts and figures, show people you're doing things. I think in addition to the therapeutics and the breakneck speed of Operation Warp Speed to have delivered vaccines to the shots to go into the arm in less time than it takes to have a baby that was done. Truly record speed. And I recount on my book, March 2nd, 2020, we're in the cabinet room. We have the pharmaceutical company heads coming in ostensibly for a meeting on drug pricing. And then President Trump shifts the whole conversation, Jerry, because that's how Donald Trump, the businessman is. He says, listen, I know you think you're here for drug pricing. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. But folks, I'm told this is the big one. When you get a vaccine, he said to Dr. Fauci, Tony, don't tell me it's going to take years. We don't have years. And of course, they all got on it. And they did it in a way with the therapeutics and the vaccines. 12 million Americans, including Biden and Harris, fortunately, got that vaccine while Donald Trump was still president. And hundreds of millions others across the world have. Now, I say this to you because in addition to that, it was the PPE, the ventilators, the school lunches. So you're right, Jerry. I can go down the list that President Trump never went down and recount for you all the great accomplishments early on. And then it all got gummed up with a comment here or a comment there. I feel the president really wanted to go out and face Americans every day and project calm and action in the face of a global pandemic. But after a while, I think that two hours up at the podium was probably too much for a lot of folks. And then that plus Joe Biden, we didn't get two hours of him a week. There was this huge golf, G-U-L-F, the sheer exposure of Americans to their two political nominees for president, the Republican incumbent Donald Trump and the Democrat Joe Biden. This all goes to the point, doesn't it, that if President Trump wants to run again, he should go back and honestly brush up on all the great accomplishments, even during COVID, because he likes to say, I shut down travel from China. That's fine. But everybody knew that. There are so many more that people don't realize. Here's a very quick example. I was part of these discussions. People don't realize that we had two choices early on on how to cover the expenses of the millions of Americans who are uninsured when it comes to COVID. We could either open up the Obamacare exchanges or we can just cover the cost. And we decided option B, cover the cost. So if you are an uninsured American, because one of the greatest big lies told by a president in modern history, which you can keep your plan, keep your doctor, lie, lie, Every American would have health insurance, big lie. Um, none of that was true. But here we are in a global pandemic. We need to help the uninsured Americans. You know what we did, Jerry? We covered the cost for uninsured Americans to get tested for COVID. And then God forbid, if you had contracted COVID and you ended up in the hospital, we paid for that hospitalization. We, the government. I've never heard the president say that or not in a long time. He should remind people of that. And so the list goes on and on. Joe Biden doesn't have much of a list. Look, I think when people talk about Donald Trump's style, they're missing the substance. The style should be less important to people than the substance. Remember, you're electing a president. You're not finding a friend. You're not finding a husband. You're electing a president who's got leadership and vision. And look, I know there's lots of talk of other candidates, and I think the bench for the Republican Party, should Trump decide not to run, is teeming with very talented men and women. The Democratic bench, not so much. And I say this for a very important reason. Every single one of those men and women would be running in part on an America First agenda, how to right this ship in the middle of a huge Biden-Harris compelled storm. It's not just about style versus substance, though, is it, with President Trump? I I mean, I think you might have been able to make that case, maybe up even conceivably up until January the 6th. But it does seem that the case that the president refused to accept the election result and then agitated to get the election result essentially overturned by trying to get Mike Pence to do something that was unconstitutional. That's more than a stylistic issue, isn't it, Kelly? And that is an actual attempt by the president to essentially subvert the democratic process. But everyone knows what happens, Jerry, and that'll be part of the voter calculus. They already know what happened. And yet he's beating Biden in these polls. He's beating all other Republican candidates among Republican primary voters. And that's because we voters were very selfish. We vote according to what affects us every single day. And they want back that Trump. They want that Trump economy back. They want that energy independence. Spite is no way to run a country. 
And it seems like our country is being run in part according to spite. Trump did it. I undo it. Trump bad, me good. No, there was nothing wrong with the Keystone Pipeline, except you killed the actual and the prospect for 42,000 jobs and 800,000 barrels per day in production. There's no reason to stop natural gas production. There's no reason to have an open southern border. So all of these issues will overcome that for many Americans. I'm sure you've seen everybody's polling, including the Wall Street Journal's polling. Everybody's polling says the same thing, where you have a certain segment of the population that's concerned about January 6th, wakes up every day and thinks about that. And then the coronavirus or COVID, uh, January 6th, and a couple of other issues have declined in terms of importance. And what's been increasing is inflation. And I think more recently, abortion and guns, certainly, that's going to animate both sides of those issues coming into the fall. But I think, Carrie, it's all part of the voter calculus. And we voters are not single issue thinkers or single issue voters. We put an awful lot into our voter cauldron, mix it up into a big brew, and then we pull the right choice from that. Um, I also wonder about these January 6th committee hearings. I think they made a couple of grievous errors from the beginning. It was wrong for the Republicans not to put Republicans on the committee, but I think it was wrong for Cheney and Kinzinger and the rest of the Democrats to not put Republicans on the committee and to not cross-examine witnesses. I'm a fully recovered attorney of many, many decades, Jerry Baker, but I'll tell you, basic questions are not being asked. People recognize it's not being run like a real courtroom. You would have asked Ms. Hutchinson last week, whom I work with, you would have asked a number of these witnesses. Um, this happened a year and a half ago. Did you write it down? What did you have for dinner two weeks ago? You can't remember? That was obviously a, a kind of a pretty dramatic moment. We are learning in the aftermath of that, that some of the things that she said are being challenged by Secret Service and other members of the White House. Did you find that testimony compelling last week or did you think there were problems with it? Well, maybe it was compelling TV for those who are constantly looking for how to get Donald Trump out of the White House. Newsflash, he's out of the White House, but it wasn't particularly compelling. And I have questions about his veracity just because if you listen very carefully, Ms. Hutchinson kept saying the gist of it was, or they said something like, that would never be able to pass in a court of law. Because immediately you would say, Ms. Hutchinson, what did you have for dinner two weeks ago? Ms. Hutchinson, were you there? Were you in the beast? Did you speak with President Trump that day? Did you speak with him the next day? Why did you email somebody at CPAC and ask for them to help you through the First Amendment Fund? Who is paying for your legal expenses now if CPAC did not come forward and pay for them? She said the January 6th committee was, quote, bs and that it sounded like she wasn't voluntarily complying until they showed up at her doorstep. She was sort of describing the process as BS. But look, I do think that cross-examination actually would have helped the committee and it would help more Americans feel like it's a fair process. I think cross-examination actually would have helped them because they could have asked additional questions. But look, you've seen this should not be a production. Jerry, I have a very simple question nobody ever asks about the January 6th committee. It's a very serious question I never hear asked, and it's this. Whom exactly is your audience? Is it Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice? Because Benny Thompson, the chair of the committee, said on day one, we don't think that we're going to have a criminal referral of Donald Trump, Department of Justice. Is it the elector to never elect Donald Trump again? Is it Republican voters? Is it the donors for Liz Cheney 2024? It's a serious question. Whom is the audience? What is the result that we're looking for here? And I think because they don't make that case every single day, it's very easy for Americans, and not just MAGA, very easy for many Americans who are very busy trying to make ends meet and wondering what next piece of chaos and crisis Biden and Harris are going to stick on our shoulders. Very easy for many Americans to say, am I your audience with the committee hearings? Because I already know what happened. And I'm either appalled, I say in my book, I'm still in shock and not in all with what happened on January 6th. And Jerry Baker, if there are people to be prosecuted, do it. I'm sure that there are crimes that were committed prosecute them, do what we do in this country, give them notice, opportunity to be heard, let them understand their punishment and keep moving forward. You mentioned that, and I think everybody would agree, that the Republican bench is very strong, in particular in comparison with the Democratic bench right now. You look at Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley or Tim Scott or Glenn Youngkin. The candidates all ran before, will all be out there again last time. It is a strong field, but the polling suggests that Donald Trump is way, way ahead of them. I saw a poll at the weekend that has him in the 50s and everybody else pretty well in you know low double digits at the most. Is there any prospect whatsoever, do you think that Donald Trump, if he decides to run, doesn't win the Republican nomination? He's the absolutely overwhelming prohibitive favorite, isn't he? He's absolutely overwhelming prohibitive favorite. And the biggest reason is because people want past to be prologue. It's because of his accomplishments. It's because he already occupied that job. And they believe did a fantastic job, as I do, as president. The Trump-Pence accomplishments are remarkable. 
and we can go through them, people don't seem to want to. But if he runs for president, he'll be talking about that. If Mike Pence runs for president, instead of Donald Trump, if Donald Trump says no, he'll be talking about the Trump-Pence accomplishment. You see Donald Trump supporting Mike Pence for president? Well, he should. If Donald Trump decides not to run, he should think very deeply about supporting his vice president because they were a magical, magnificent, marvelous team. Except at the end, if the stories are to be believed, President Trump sort of stood happily by nodding while the crowd called for Mike Pence to be hanged. Um, I don't think that that's true. And the president has denied that. I think it's really unfair for people to repeat that if he's denied it and yet, you know, just gloss right past four years worth of accomplishments that they did together. And I'm one of the few people I think left in this country that actually speaks regularly to Donald Trump and Mike Pence. I have a great relationship with each of them and I'm very proud of the accomplishments that they put forward. People have to understand that they are able to speak from their bigger houses, their fatter portfolios and stock positions because they're able to criticize Donald Trump because of Donald Trump. But that aside, uh, I think that's why he's the primitive favorite. Now, look, there will be people who primary him. I'm convinced of that. I told him that. But you have this sort of never Trump lane or anybody but Trump lane in the Republican Party. It's already crowded and it's more like a bike path than a full lane. And it's crowded with people who think somehow We're going to go backwards to the Mitt Romney, John McCain model. Are you kidding me? Nobody wants those type of candidacies. And by the way, nobody wants their consultants who failed to get the job done. They're all a bunch of never Trumpers, Lincoln Project, the rest of them. Mitt Romney just wrote an op-ed. And basically, he he makes clear that op-ed that the last Republican presidential candidate he voted for was him. I mean, this is no way to project confidence and a forward-looking vision. I'm glad you raised that because I wanted to talk about this and one or two other themes that come out in the book to me very strongly and I'm very interested in, which is, you know, again, you, you've advised Republican candidates over many, many years. You're working for Ted Cruz initially in 2015 um, when he was running for the nomination in 2016. Again, then he went to work with Donald Trump. I think we're all trying still to understand is what happened to the Republican Party? How did it get so out of touch with its voters to the point where... It nominated in 2016 and again in 2020 and may well again in 2024, a candidate who repudiates so much, not only of what the Republican Party stands for, but its previous presidential candidates. I don't think in history there's ever been a candidate who has explicitly repudiated the party's last three presidential candidates in the way that Donald Trump did with Mitt Romney, John McCain and George W. Bush. How did the party get so out of line with voters and what kind of a party is it now? I mean, is it Donald Trump's party? What's left of the Republican Party, the candidates for whom you used to work? Terry, it's an excellent question. I really scour in my book and I project forward about it. Too. Here's the way I would break it down. People left the Republican Party because they felt the Republican Party had left them. Who were they? Well, they were predominantly working America. And I feel with Mitt Romney, you didn't build that entrepreneur, job creator. That's all fine. But about 7% of the country are true job creators. Another 7% maybe are job seekers. You know what the vast majority of American households are? Job holders. And it's Donald Trump who spoke to them. He basically elevated issues that had been mired in single digits in the polls, if registering at all, like illegal immigration, like trade, and said, China is eating our lunch. We are shipping our wealth and our jobs overseas to China, then Mexico, to who knows where. Our blighted storefronts, our hollowed out factories, manufacturing base, mining, coal energy production. And a lot of people stood up and said, you're right. And Donald Trump is somebody who always had more confidence in and was more at ease with the hard hats down at the construction site than up in the Trump Tower with the financiers and the fancy lawyers. He made that very clear. I knew that because I knew him then. And he basically was talking to the American worker, not just the people like you and me who went to college or got a postgraduate degree, but people who graduated high school, and got their skill certificate and were able to support themselves the next day and every day since. The welders, the iron workers, the guys in the private trades, the carpenters, the plumbers, like the men in my family, my cousins, my uncles, my extended family. To this day, that's how they support themselves. And you know what? He said, forgotten man, forgotten woman. I like to add Jerry, forgotten child, because I'm a big school choice charter school advocate. And people nodded their head and they said, you know what? He's an outsider to the system. I'm an outsider to the system. We need an outsider who's going to go to Washington owing no one nothing like I am. And he really tapped into that. Now, who is the Republican Party? He's actually expanded the party. He increased the number of non-white voters that voted for a Republican presidential candidate. And now you see all of the polls, especially Hispanics, Asian Americans, and to a lesser extent, but right there, African Americans realigning toward a conservative philosophy, limited government, 
Um, they're offended that the Democratic Party is worried about Latin X and attacking religious liberty. They're education voters, they're economic upward mobility voters. Look at what's happening to Hispanic America, the Rio Grande Valley and elsewhere. It's Donald Trump, who's mainly responsible for realigning those voters close to the Republican Party. It's a good point that this is a transformation, isn't it? Because as you say, we're not going to go back to the party of Mitt Romney and even to some extent of John McCain. And it is striking that there is no one really, nobody's really going to go back to the age of sort of accommodation with China, to a soft on immigration policy, to you know, an aggressive, assertive, neoconservative foreign policy. I know there are some critics who disagree with that, but that is a genuine transformation. And it was Trump who was able to actually understand that in a way that other Republicans couldn't. And his timing was perfect. Here's a man, Donald J. Trump, who thought about running for president in 1980, uh, many times since, was more serious, I think, than people realize about going up against Barack Obama in 2012. Even I did a poll for him in 2011. My poll showed that it'd be a very tough climb for him. I think I'm the only Republican pollster to publicly say that Mitt Romney was going to lose to Barack Obama. The Romney people didn't like it. They embarrassed themselves and all those people at the Fleet Center on election night. You know, staff infection is ridiculous. Consultants walking RICO violation, the Republican consultants. Yeah, I say this because Donald Trump was pretty serious in 2011 going into 2012, but 2016 was the right year. Because this country voted, they took a chance on somebody in 2008 in Senator Obama, who four years earlier, Jerry Baker, had been a state senator. He was a political outsider, not just because he was our first African-American president, but he truly was a political outsider in Washington, beating Hillary Clinton, the consummate insider. And then there comes Donald Trump eight years later, doing it all over again. It's only the prognosticators and the political practitioners and many people in the mainstream media who missed all that. The country saw all that. And in fact, they were leading the charge for that. Here's one thing I wanted to mention to you. A bunch of Democratic pollsters and consultants, I know all of them, they admitted after the 2016 race and the 2020 race, two different election outcomes, same admission and same apology from them. Two election cycles in a row, they say they missed the strength and the sheer numbers of the Trump voter. And you know why that is, Jerry Baker? As I say in my memoir, here's the deal. We never deeply examine that which we deeply disdain. People are not paying attention to why this happened. Instead, they denigrate and castigate these voters as toothless hillbillies who are uneducated, toting guns, having lots of babies and worshiping God. That's a terrible way to look at each other in this country. And I got to tell you, they are their strength in numbers for them. It's also the way that they slice and dice and sort of narrow cast all of us according to our sex or our age or our race or our geographic or our political ideology. Guess what? You can't just talk to women from the waist down and expect them to listen to you. Excuse me, I'm a woman for whom the waist up is where my brain, my eyes, my ears, my heart, and my mouth are. You can't just say women only care about abortion. You can't just think uh, Hispanics only care about immigration. You can't just narrow cast all of us. We are full body, full thinking people who throw an awful lot into our voter pot before we make an intelligent decision. We're going to take a short break there, but when we come back, we'll have more with Kellyanne Conway, political consultant, former advisor to President Trump and author of a new memoir, Here's the Deal. Welcome back. We're talking with Kellyanne Conway. On this issue of this new coalition, which I think is fascinating, record numbers of Hispanics voting for Republicans and very likely seems to vote for Republicans in the midterms this year. Significant numbers of Asian Americans, even African Americans seem to be. Now, is that just because of the extraordinary level of dissatisfaction and disapproval with the Democratic Party right now and the extraordinary mess that it seems to be making of everything that in every demographic Republicans are advancing? Or is there something else going on here? Is there something structural changing here which goes well beyond just the unpopularity of the Democrats at the moment? It's both of the above. And you said something that most Democrats don't realize or articulate, which is that it's not just a Biden problem. It's a Democrat Party problem. They're not seeing that. We saw that in focus groups starting about a year ago, that people, they can blame Biden, but they did not yet think it was a Democratic Party problem. And this is also a reason, Jerry, and I'm very forthright about it in my book. This is also a reason why I caution against Republicans talking too much about Joe Biden's obvious mental and physical acuity problems, challenges. The art of politics is not to tell people what they can see, it's to tell them what they can't see. And everybody can see these obvious deficits. If you do that, you're creating sympathy and excusing Joe Biden's conduct. I think the Democratic Party should be made to eat and own and answer for all of Joe Biden's terrible policies. We're almost at the one-year anniversary of that deadly, chaotic, unnecessary pullout of Afghanistan. And that should become a Democratic 
Party albatross, not just a Joe Biden. But it's not just the failing of the Democratic Party. They have lost touch with what's important to America. Woke is a joke. Defund the police were three of the most poisonous words ever articulated on behalf of the Democratic Party in history. Defund the police. And and now that we're trying to backtrack is we have a 25% increase in crime in our major cities since Joe Biden became president. Even he says, I'm not for defunding the police. I'm for funding the police. Well, too late, pal. Rest on your party's shoulders. And there's an internecine battle. But it's also give the Republican Party its due. It's become the party of the worker. And it is talking to people about employment, about what happens with the dignity of work, job benefits, pension, you know, the right kind of pensions, the right kind of health insurance to get from your employers. But we are trying to create well-paying jobs. I think it's also the COVID hangover. You know what, Jerry? COVID went from being a reason to have kids staring at a screen and their phones and call it school to becoming an excuse. It became an excuse for more trillions. It became an excuse for masking up CRT, school board meetings. So look, I would boil it down to this. The Democratic Party right now is trying to tell the rest of us, don't believe what you see, believe what we say. And Americans are too smart for that. They're saying, no, we believe what we see. We believe what we see in the grocery cart, at the gas pump, in the school board meetings, in Ukraine, at the southern border, in our major cities with crime and drugs on the rise. We believe what we see as Americans, not what you say as Democrats. Finally, Kellyanne, something obviously is very dear to you and you talk a lot about in the book is women and, and the role of women. You are yourself a woman. Obviously, you've achieved great success, as you said, first woman campaign manager to run a successful presidential campaign. But you talk very powerfully about your upbringing by a group of obviously very powerful, very strong women. Where's the Republican Party with women these days? Obviously, the media and the Democratic Party always see something like abortion and the Roe v. Wade, the Theresa Dobbs decision, and kind of immediately assumes, ah, this is, you know, the Republican Party's war on women. We hear that all the time and how much difficulty they're going to have with women, ignoring the fact that actually that a very significant number of women in this country are actually pro-life and approve of the decision. You may mentioned it yourself a little bit earlier, Donald Trump's language sometimes turned off a lot of those suburban women. Where does the Republican Party stand right now with women voters? There is still a big gender gap. We've seen that in every election for some time. Where does it stand and how does it close that gap and how does it make its case the Republican Party is actually naturally the home of women and is really has an agenda that can really develop and improve women's lives? A question that we've been grappling with for 34 years since I first took my job with Ronald Reagan's pollster, Dick Worthlin, um, and he assigned the gender gap to me. Uh, obviously, there was a big team, but I was an $8 an hour pollster, you know, assisting there. And so we're still grappling with it. But I got to say, the Republican Party is on the move with women. And here's why. The party that respects women as full thinkers on any range of issues and doesn't narrow cast to them on just abortion or just healthcare or just education or just guns will win women. And I would remind everybody, Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton, who would have been the first female president of the United States of America in history with a majority of the voters being women. It's a very important fact. And I say this to you because women are listening to people talk about economy, energy, yes, abortion and guns, but also education, healthcare. I like to put it this way, Jerry. I call it the SAFE acronym. S is for security, A, affordability, F is foreign policy and fairness, and E is education. I have an entire way of messaging that to the Republican Party, to candidates who want to listen. It certainly worked with Hillary Clinton. I would say these recent two decisions on guns and on abortion, boom, the media and the Democrats right away, you know what they call abortion? Women's rights, women's health. Excuse me. Women feel like they have all kinds of rights. Abortion may be among them. But remember, there is a growing number of women in this country calling themselves pro-life, mainly based on medicine and science, not necessarily religion and morality. But number two, one of the fastest group of new gun owners in this country are women, including women of color. They're out there buying protection under the Second Amendment. And so I think when people don't look at cultural indicators, consumer data, and they're only looking at us as voters or single issue thinkers, they're missing the essence of women. I respect all women. And I think it's an incredible time to be a woman in the United States of America. And to the victor go the spoils, meaning to the person, the candidate or the party that respects all women for all of their thoughts and all their issue priorities, they will win. Now the left talks about equity and equality. We're all for equality. That's the American way. But I think that more Republicans and conservatives should talk about fairness and just start every question with, is it fair that, is it fair 
that the government takes 55% of what you own? Is it fair your husband or you leave before the crack of dawn to go to work and other people never even leave? And you all own the same house that all looks the same in your development? Is it fair that school boards are arresting parents and teaching your kids nonsense instead of reading, writing, arithmetic? And I think that issue of fairness is a big one for American women. And I plan to whoever runs in 2024, if they'll have me, to help them, to help him or her, to make sure that we continue to respect all women and not allow folks to narrow cast. It's the number one mistake I think the Democrats and the media are, are making right now is to misread the Dobbs decision. By the way, the Dobbs case is about 15-week abortion. That's second trimester. The majority of Americans say no abortion past the first trimester. Kellyanne Conway, political consultant, strategist, advisor to former, and perhaps who knows, future President Donald Trump. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jerry. All the best. Thank you. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal Opinion Pages. Thanks very much for listening. Please join us again next week for another exploration of the issues driving our world. Thank you and goodbye.